Hello, everyone, and welcome to the History Speaker Series. Tonight's presentation is all about Alfred Nobel and the Canadian Nobel Prize winners. Here we have Fred Colleen, who uh, is uh, a dedicated volunteer here at the museum um, and in many other areas as well. Um, he is on our history committee, and he's also part of our uh, ex have on right now, which is called Welcome Home to Aurelia all about immigration to Aurelia. Uh, and this is because Fred was born in Sweden, uh, which you'll hear him talk about a little bit in his presentation. It's always such a pleasure to work with Fred and hear his enthusiasm for history. Uh, so today it's my honor to be able to introduce to you Fred Colleen. Take it away, Fred. Welcome to our Oma Nobel evening. In the last few weeks, you may have heard about the latest Nobel Prizes being awarded, including one to a Canadian. Most people do not know very much about Alfred Nobel and the history behind the Nobel Prizes, but I'm hoping you will agree that it's quite an interesting story. If you do some traveling around central Sweden, you may come across a lakeside town a bit smaller than Aurelia called Karlskoga. As you drive around the town, you may notice that there's a statue of three horses rearing up in the middle of one of the roundabouts. This unassuming artwork is a reminder that the Nobel Prizes would probably not exist today if it were not for three special horses. It shows that the course of history is often filled with surprises, twists, and turns. Alfred Nobel was never married, and yet a famous woman had a major influence on him and may have planted the seed that became the Nobel Peace Prize. Alfred Nobel was a bit of a loner with few good friends and yet an extraordinarily faithful friend worked tirelessly to overcome many obstacles as executor of Nobel's will to make Nobel's final wishes a reality. Another twist on the path to the creation of the Nobel Prizes was an erroneous obituary Finally, the Nobel Prizes had to be created in defiance of the royalty. Suffice to say, the creation of the Nobel Prizes was never a sure thing. I'll get back to these points later, but let's first look at who Alfred Nobel was. Alfred Nobel is often remembered as the inventor of dynamite. People sometimes wonder why a person best known for blowing things up wanted to create a set of prizes to reward the best advancements of humanity. Even though some of his inventions were used for military purposes, Alfred Nobel was actually a pacifist. He believed that if weapons of war were made powerful enough, war between armies would become unthinkable because total destruction would only take minutes. It can be an interesting debate even today to argue if he is right or wrong. Alfred Nobel was born in Stockholm, Sweden on October 21st, 1833. He was often sick as a child and spent much of his time reading books and writing instead of playing. His father, Emmanuel Nobel, was an inventor and engineer who started a successful tool and explosives business in St. Petersburg, Russia and manufactured sea mines for the Russian Navy. Alfred and his mother and three brothers all moved to St. Petersburg in 1842. Emmanuel was not well educated and yet believed that a good education was more important than worldly goods. In 1850, Alfred Nobel went to Paris and studied under Ascanio Sobrero, the inventor of nitroglycerin. Ascanio thought that nitroglycerin was impractical for any real applications because it could explode almost spontaneously. After his return to Sweden, Alfred set to work to study and experiment with explosives. He invented a detonator in 1863. He also invented an explosive based on a mixture of nitroglycerin and gunpowder. The explosive was manufactured in a small plant at Helenebore on the outskirts of Stockholm. Alfred's younger brother Emil pitched in to help at the plant. 
On September 3rd, 1864, an explosion at the plant killed Emil and three other workers. Alfred mourned the loss of his brother for a long time after. To Alfred, this was a major lesson to improve the safety of his manufacturing methods. By 1867, he had developed an improved way of stabilizing nitroglycerin by mixing it with a porous silicous earth. He called this new invention dynamite after the Greek word for power. The new explosive was 50 times more powerful than gunpowder. Almost simultaneously, a Swiss engineer, J.R. Le Chaux, invented a diamond drill bits and a motorized hammer drill. The dynamite sticks were made small enough to fit into the drilled holes. The combination of dynamite and the new rock drills made a huge difference in the ease of excavating rock for major construction projects. A rock cut that may have taken many weeks with gunpowder and pickaxes could be done in a few days with rock drills and dynamite. Alfred Nobel became a prolific inventor and eventually received 355 international patents, second only to Thomas Edison at the time. Other notable inventions of his were blasting caps, blasting gelatin, ballistite, and artificial silk and artificial leather. Alfred Nobel built up a worldwide industry manufacturing explosives. He also invested in Brand Nobel, an oil company started by his older brothers Ludwig and Robert. Brand means fire in Swedish, so the name means fire Nobel. Brand Nobel became the third largest oil company in the world, and all three brothers enjoyed great wealth. Alfred Nobel also owned many armaments factories, but roughly 90% of his revenues were derived from the sale of explosives used for construction projects, such as railways, harbors, canals, building demolition, and mines. Later in life, Alfred Nobel became the wealthiest man in Europe. And yet Alfred Nobel was a man of contradictions. As an inventor and businessman, he was focused and tough. On a personal level, he was modest and shy and almost incapable of connecting with the opposite sex. And yet he was a good listener. He was interested in literature and wrote poetry, plays and novels, although he was never published. His complex personality puzzled his contemporaries. He would often throw himself at his work with tremendous energy, but was also a lonely recluse who was prone to bouts of depression. He spent much of his time traveling to his manufacturing facilities in Europe and North America and owned a large villa in Paris for many years. In 1875, at age 42, he advertised for a personal secretary in Vienna and hired an Austrian by the name of Bertha Kingsky to work for him at his Paris office. Bertha had been working as a governess for the von Suttner family back in Austria, but was asked to leave when it was found out that she and the son in the family, Arthur von Suttner, had fallen in love. Arthur was seven years her junior. Alfred Nobel seemed quite taken with Bertha. Bertha confided in Alfred about her past history, but this didn't seem to diminish Alfred's interest in her. Alfred shared some of his poetry with, with Bertha, and she was surprised at how much her employer was revealing about himself. Alfred and Bertha also talked about how to achieve peace in the world. After a week in Paris, Bertha received a telegram from Arthur where he said that he could not live without her. The next day, Alfred left on a business trip to Glasgow. After Alfred had left, Bertha decided to return to Vienna. Bertha and Arthur von Suttner were married in secret and eloped to Western Georgia in the Russian Empire. Although Bertha was only employed by Alfred Nobel for eight days, they maintained a lifelong friendship. Bertha, now Bertha von Suttner, wrote a book called Lay Down Your Arms. And after returning to Austria in 1885, she founded the Austrian Peace Movement. 
Alfred Nobel helped finance her organization and introduced Bertha to prominent peace activists in Paris. Bertha became a well-known peace activist and organized several European peace conferences. They kept up an extensive correspondence and it's very likely that Bertha von Suttner was the major influence in Alfred Nobel's decision to create a peace prize. In 1888, the death of Alfred's brother Ludwig caused a French newspaper to publish an obituary for Alfred in error. The obituary read, Le Marchand de la Mort est mort. The merchant of death is dead. Alfred was shocked that he would be remembered in this way, and this event had a major impact in his decision to leave a better legacy. In 1894, Alfred Nobel bought an ironworks company called Bofors in Karlskoga, Sweden. After years of depression and self-doubt, he found a new energy and enthusiasm as he invested heavily in the nearly bankrupt company and turned it into a successful arms manufacturer. Besides explosives, the company manufactured cannons, shells, artificial silk, and artificial leather. He managed to make some very good friends at this time, including a young chemical engineer by the name of Ragnar Subman, who worked for Alfred Nobel in his private lab. Ragnar agreed to be the executor of Alfred Nobel's will. Alfred Nobel took more time to enjoy himself and was often seen riding a special rubber wheeled carriage around town pulled by three Orlov stallions. He liked to ride his carriage at high speed. The local residents could always tell when Alfred Nobel's carriage was approaching. Only the thunder of the hooves of the three stallions could be heard. The carriage itself was eerily silent. On December 10th, 1896, Alfred Nobel passed away from a stroke at his winter residence in San Remo, Italy. His will, much to the surprise of his relatives, left 94% of his wealth to the creation of the Nobel Prizes. The relatives wanted to get his fortune and challenge the will. They were successful in getting a Swedish court to rule that the terms of the will be decided in Paris because Alfred Nobel spent most of his adult life there. It was thought that the French would be more sympathetic to the wishes of the relatives than the Swedish courts would be. Alfred Nobel's good friend and executor, Ragnar Sulman, advocated to keep the will unchanged. Ragnar researched French law extensively and found an old law that defined residency as a location where a person keeps their horses. The three Orlov stallions were kept at Alfred Nobel's estate in Karlskoga, so the French court ruled that Nobel was thus a resident of Sweden, and the will was sent back to the Swedish courts for a final ruling. The Swedish courts upheld Alfred Nobel's will, and the Nobel Prizes were a step closer to becoming a reality. Ragnar Sulman had many other obstacles to overcome along the way. As a young chemical engineer, he had no legal background. Alfred Nobel had not trusted lawyers, so his will was handwritten without any legal advice. The contents of the will had not been discussed with anyone before Alfred Nobel died, and parts of the will were a bit vague. Large bequests for the advancement of science, literature, and peace were not exactly common. Sulman had the good sense to engage a lawyer. The money had been left to no one person or institution, so Sudman had to create the Nobel Foundation. Alfred Nobel's securities and cash reserves were held in various banks around Paris. The relatives made a last ditch effort to gain control of the assets by asking the French authorities to intervene and seize the assets for taxation. Sudman may only have been 26, but he was not shy about direct action. Carrying a revolver for security, he and his assistant simply drove around from one bank to the next in Paris in a horse and carriage. 
using his authority as executor, he just removed everything he could find, all monies, shares, bonds, securities, and other documents belonging to the Nobel estate. He then proceeded to the office of the Swedish consul general, who had agreed to help him. In a locked room, and while Nobel's relatives were in another room in the same building, they divided and packaged the securities so that each package complied with the insurer's requirements that no package exceed a specified value. The packages were then freighted back to Sweden from the Gare du Nord railway station as registered packages. It is often said that Ragnar Sulman is the unsung hero behind the Nobel Prizes. From my own perspective, I have always felt like I have a bit of a connection to Alfred Nobel because I am a Swedish Canadian inventor, also with a large number of patents. If you ever used an NCR ATM with envelope free deposit or smart deposit, then you've probably used some of the technology that I patented and helped to develop. This Canadian developed technology can be seen right here in Aurelia and all around the world. I last visited Karskuga in 2013 when my wife Anne and I went to the Alfred Nobel Museum at his old estate. When we entered the dining room at the estate, there was a nice representation of Alfred Nobel sitting at the table. Anne took a picture. The tour guide started to tell Alfred Nobel's story, but everyone got a big start when Alfred Nobel stood up and said, why don't I tell my own story? It was one of the most memorable tours I've had anywhere. As an engineering summer student, I had the experience of working at Beaufort in Kaskoga back in 1976. It was interesting to see how the explosives plants had been built with walls that hinge open in the event of an explosion to prevent the buildings from collapsing. The insides of the walls were padded to reduce injury to workers if an explosion, however rare, did happen. The lesson from Emil Nobel's death had not been forgotten. The explosives were manufactured in small buildings with open spaces around them to further minimize damage and injuries in case of an accident. There is a connection to Ontario with this image. This picture actually shows explosives manufacturing plants in Nobel, Ontario. The plants and the town were built in 1914, just north of Perry Sound to support the war effort. The factory closed in 1918, but opened again during the Second World War. The plant mysteriously caught fire on VJ Day, August 14, 1945. Local residents were treated to a massive fireworks display that night. 56 railcar loads of cordite were moved away from the plant just in time to avert an explosion of atomic bomb proportions. Nobel, Ontario later became the manufacturing site for the Arenda engines that were to power the Avro Arrow, the Canadair Sabre Jet, and the CF-104 Starfighter. Alfred Nobel's inventions had a major effect on Canada. Dynamite was a critical enabling technology that allowed the westward expansion of the Canadian railroads through the Canadian Shield and the Rockies, as well as the many canals, roadways, harbors, and mines across the country. Five Nobel Prizes are awarded each year according to the will. The prizes are meant to reward those who best serve humanity and were first awarded in 1901. The prizes for physics and chemistry are both awarded by the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. The prize for Phys physiology or medicine is awarded by the Karolinska Institute of Stockholm. The prize for literature is awarded by the Swedish Academy and the Peace Prize is awarded by the Norwegian Nobel Committee, which is designated by the Norwegian Parliament. There was some delay between the settlement of the will and the start of the awards. The King of Sweden wanted the awards to be restricted to only Swedish people so that the prize monies could be kept in Sweden. 
the Swedish institutions were hesitant to defy the king. Although Norway was part of Sweden at the time, the Norwegians had no compunctions about defying the king, and this broke the impasse. The Swedish institutions all followed suit after the Norwegian initiative. All of the prizes are awarded in Stockholm, Sweden, except for the Peace Prize, which is awarded in Oslo, Norway. The monetary award for each of the five Nobel Prizes is currently about $1.4 million Canadian. All of the prize money and expenses are paid by the Nobel Foundation. The Nobel Foundation manages the funds from Alfred Nobel's personal fortune, which is currently valued at about $800 million Canadian. In 1968, the Swedish Central Bank created a prize for economic science on the occasion of the bank's 300th anniversary. It was funded separately from the other five Nobel Prizes by the bank. It was first awarded in 1969. It is generally not considered a true Nobel Prize and has instead been designated as a prize in memory of Alfred Nobel. It is awarded by the Royal Swedish Academy for Sciences in Stockholm, Sweden. Now to the awards themselves. For over a century, the Nobel Prizes have been considered the most prestigious awards in the world. In the spirit of Alfred Nobel's will, the prizes are open to all humanity, regardless of race, nationality, religion, or gender. Two of the early Nobel laureates were Marie Curie for the 1903 Prize for Physics and Bertha von Suttner, Alfred's former secretary, for the 1905 Peace Prize. In 1911, Marie Curie became the first person to win a second Nobel Prize. There are a total of 26 Canadian individuals who have been awarded the Nobel Prize over the years. Almost all of these awards were split among co-developers or for related discoveries, except for the prizes for literature and peace. Today, we honor those individuals and their achievements. Starting with the most recent, the Canadian Nobel Prize winners are David Card, very recently was awarded the 2021 Nobel Prize for Economic Sciences for his empirical contributions to labor economics. By studying the effect of real world events on labor markets, he was able to turn conventional wisdom on its head. For example, he was able to show that a modest increase in minimum wage does not increase unemployment. He was born in Guelph, Ontario and attended Queen's University. He is now a professor at the University of California in Berkeley. James Peebles, 2019 Nobel Prize in Physics for theoretical discoveries in physical cosmology. Beginning in the mid 1960s, Peebles developed a theoretical framework that underlies much of what physicists understand about the universe today. He was born in St. Boniface, Manitoba, attended the University of Manitoba, and is now the Albert Einstein Professor of Science Emeritus at Princeton University. Donna Strickland, 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics for co-developing a method of generating high intensity, ultra short optical laser pulses. This technology is used today for laser eye surgery and fine laser, uh, laser cutting technology in industry. She was born in Guelph, Ontario and is currently a professor at the University of Waterloo. Arthur B. MacDonald, 2015 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. This affects the laws of physics at a very fundamental level. He's born in Sydney, Nova Scotia, and has been a professor at Queen's University. Alice Munro, 2013 Nobel Prize in Literature for being the master of the contemporary short story. She grew up in the small Canadian town of Wingham, Ontario, the kind of town that often provides a backdrop for her stories. 
With subtle means, she is able to demonstrate the impact that seemingly trivial events ha can have on a person's life. Ralph M. Steinman, 2011 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his discovery of the dendritic cell and its role in adaptive immunity. This discovery changed the field of immunology. He was born in Montreal and worked his entire career at Rockefeller University. Jack W. Sostak, 2009 Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of how chromosomes are protected by telomeres and the enzyme telomerase. Telomeres are like the caps on the ends of each strand of DNA and protect our chromosomes, much like plastic tips on the ends of our shoelaces. He grew up in Ottawa and was a professor at Harvard Medical School. Willard S. Boyle, 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics for the invention of an imaging semiconductor circuit the CCD sensor. This is the basis for all digital cameras. He was born in Amherst, Nova Scotia, attended McGill and worked for Bell Labs. Robert A. Mundell, 1999 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for his analysis of monetary and fiscal policy under different exchange rate regimes and his analysis of optimum currency areas Mundell is known as the father of the Euro and a pioneer in supply side economics. He was born in Kingston, Ontario and attended the Vancouver School of Economics of UBC. He chaired the Department of Economics at the University of Waterloo. Myron S. Scholes, 1997 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for a new method to determine the value of derivatives. The model provides a conceptual framework for valuing options such as calls or puts. Myron Scholz was born in Timmins, Ontario. He taught at MIT and Stanford University. William Vickery, 1996 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences for contributions to the economic theory of incentives under asymmetric information. It is a theory on how economic incentives such as taxation, tolls, or user fees can affect people's behavior. William Vickery was born in Victoria, BC and worked at Columbia University for most of his career. Bertram N. Brockhaus, 1994 Nobel Prize in Physics for the development of neutron spectroscopy. Neutron beams are used to chart chart the properties of different materials and molecules. Bertram Brockhaus was born in Lethbridge, Alberta and taught at McMaster University. Michael Smith, 1993 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his fundamental contributions to the establishment of oligonucleotide-based site-directed mutagenesis and its development for protein studies. This is one of the foundational tools of genetic engineering. He was born in Blackpool, England and immigrated to Canada in 1956. He was the founding director of the UBC Biotechnology Lab. Rudolf A. Marcus, 1992 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his contributions to the theory of electron transfer reactions in chemical systems. The electron transfer is one of the most basic forms of chemical reaction and without it, life cannot exist. He was born in Montreal and attended McGill University then taught for many years in, in the United States. Richard E. Taylor, 1990 Nobel Prize in Physics for investigations concerning deep inelastic scattering of electrons on protons and bound neutrons which have been of essential importance for the development of the quark model in particle physics. He was born in Medicine Hat, Alberta and attended the University of Alberta. Most of his career was spent at Stanford University. Sidney Altman, 1989 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of catalytic properties of RNA. 
This knowledge opened up new fields of scientific research and biotechnology and caused scientists to rethink old theories of how cells function. It also led to new hypotheses about the history of the emergence of RNA on Earth and the possibility that RNA was a molecule that gave rise to Earth's first life forms. Sidney Altman was born in Montreal. He studied at MIT and did much of his later research work at Cambridge University in England, then taught at Yale University. John Polanyi, 1986 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, for contributions concerning the dy dynamics of chemical elementary processes. Polanyi developed a technique that is known as infrared chemiluminescence, based on the observation that molecules, when excited, emit infrared light. Using this effect, he was able to trace the exchange of chemical bonds, thus helping to detail the disposal of excess energy that occurs during the process of chemical reactions. He was born in Berlin, Germany, grew up in England, and attended Manchester University, then moved to Canada in 1952 and taught at the University of Toronto. Henry Tog, 1983 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his work on the mechanisms of electron transfer reactions, especially in metal complexes. Tog's findings have been applied in selecting metallic compounds for use as catalysts, pigments, and superconductors, and in understanding the function of metal ions as constituents of certain enzymes. He was born in Newdorf, Saskatchewan, and attended the University of Saskatchewan. He later taught at Cornell University, University of Chicago, and Stanford University. David H. Hubel, 1981 Nobel Prize in Medicine, for discoveries concerning information processing in the visual system. This prize was awarded in recognition of his significant contributions to the understanding of brain functioning and visual information processing. He was born in Windsor, Ontario, attended McGill University, then joined the Harvard Medical School. Saul Bellow, 1976 Nobel Prize in Literature, for the human understanding and subtle analysis of contemporary culture that are combined in his work. His writing exhibited the mixture of rich picaresque novel and subtle analysis of our culture, of entertaining adventure, drastic and tragic episodes in quick succession, interspersed with philosophic conversation, all developed by a commentator with a witty tongue and penetrating insight into the outer and inner complications that drive us to act or prevent us from acting, and that be, can be called the dilemma of our age. He was born in Lachine, Quebec, and his family moved to Chicago when he was nine. He studied and taught at the University of Chicago. Gerhard Hertzberg, 1971 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his contributions to the knowledge of electronic structure and geometry of molecules, particularly free radicals. Hertzberg's research was molecular spectroscopy, the analysis of the spectra of molecules in order to determine their structure. He specialized in free radicals, important intermediates of chemical reactions that have very short lifetimes of microseconds under laboratory conditions. Born in Hamburg, Germany, he left Nazi Germany in 1935. He taught at the University of Saskatchewan and joined the National Research Council. Charles B. Huggins, 1966 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his discoveries concerning hormonal treatment of prostatic cancer. This was the first discovery that showed that cancer could be controlled by chemicals. He is often known as the father of chemotherapy. He was born in Halifax, Nova Scotia. He studied at Acadia University and Harvard Medical School, then spent most of his career at the University of Chicago. Former Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson, 1957 Nobel Peace Prize for his role in defusing the 1956 Suez Crisis. 
1956, Great Britain, France, and Israel launched an attack on Egypt aimed at removing President Nasser. The Soviet Union threatened to use atomic weapons against the assailants. The Suez Crisis found its solution when the Canadian Secretary of State for External Affairs, Lester Pearson, won support for sending a United Nations emergency force to the region to separate the warring parties. Lester Pearson was born in Toronto and attended U of T. William F. Gielk, 1949 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for contributions in the field of chemical thermodynamics, especially concerning the behavior of substances at extremely low temperatures. He managed to prove many of the theories of thermodynamics. He was born in Niagara Falls, Ontario, and spent most of his career at the University of California in Berkeley. Frederick Banting, 1923 Nobel Prize in Medicine for the discovery of insulin. Canada's first Nobel Prize winner grew up in Simcoe County on a farm near Alliston. Frederick Banting first met with Scottish-born John McLeod in 1920 to discuss his ideas on how to produce what became known as insulin. The two collaborated and McLeod provided lab space and financing. Frederick Banting was able to isolate and extract insulin from animal pancreases in 1921. This year is a 100th anniversary of that discovery. Frederick Banting and John McLeod received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1923. At age 32, Banting remains the youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize for Medicine. In 2014, Banting was voted fourth on the CBC's list of greatest Canadians. And on July 13, 2021, the Royal Canadian Mint released a $2 coin commemorating the 100th anniversary of the isolation and purification of insulin. The discovery of insulin in 1921 is one of the 20th century's most celebrated med medical discoveries and saved millions of lives around the world. In 1923, Banting and McLeod gave away the patent for insulin because they felt that it should not be, that it should belong to the whole world and not to any individual. If there ever was a Nobel Prize for generosity, this action would surely qualify. Insulin production began at Connaught Labs in Toronto in 1923. The Nobel Peace Prize has sometimes been awarded to international organizations rather than just to individuals. Some of these organizations have had significant Canadian participation. Half of the 1995 Nobel Peace Prize went to the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs, a series of meetings of scientists and decision makers founded in Pugwash, Nova Scotia in 1957 by Canadian philanthropist Cyrus Eaton. The focus of these conferences was to reduce the role of and eventually eliminate nuclear arms. In 1999, Canadian physician James Urbinski, president of the International Council for Médecins Sans Frontières, accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of that organization. Half of the 2007 Peace Prize went to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, on which Canadian climate scientist Andrew Weaver served as one of the lead authors. So what is Alfred Nobel's legacy? Alfred Nobel is often, often seen as a man of contradictions, the inventor of dynamite, and yet, the creator of the Nobel Prizes. Many people don't know who Alfred Nobel was, and yet a mention of the Nobel Prizes brings almost universal recognition. People from almost every corner of the globe have won Nobel Prizes and have received the monumental recognition that goes with it. For the recipients, it is a huge honor to travel to Sweden or Norway to receive a Nobel Prize. In the picture, you can see King Carl Gustav of 
Sweden congratulating the Nobel laureate. The Nobel prizes are recognized as one of the world's most prestigious and celebrated ways to encourage, recognize, and reward men's greatest achievements. May we all aspire to do our best for mankind. Thank you for attending our OMA Nobel event this evening. Thank you so much, Fred. Beautifully done and fascinating presentation. Uh, thank you to everyone who is watching this. Uh, check back in next month when we have our Carmichael fundraising uh, installment of the History Speaker Series. Uh, and uh, that will be a fascinating talk uh, on a topic related to the Group of Seven uh, featuring Dr. Anna Hudson. So check out our website um, at aureliamuseum.org for more information on that. Thank you again, Fred. Thank you.